This podcast is brought to you by Audible. Have you been wanting to read more, but don't seem to have the time? Well, with Audible, you can read your books without having to find the extra time in your busy schedule. Stuck in traffic on your way home from work? Why not marathon the Harry Potter books? In the gym and want to learn about the First Lady? Well, you can listen to Becoming Michelle Obama while doing Leg Day. And if you go to audibletrial.com slash cultivate, you get a month free of Audible. That includes one credit that you can trade in for any audiobook of your choice, access to thousands of audiobooks free to listen to with your account, and best of all, you have access to all of your favorite podcasts in the app as well. So be sure to go to my link, audibletrial.com slash cultivate. That's C-U-L-T-I-V, the number eight, to sign up for a free month of Audible and start reading today. Thank you, Audible, for supporting the show. We are. We are. We are Cultivate. 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 We are Cultivate. Hello and welcome to Yield Crime, where we discuss the funny, strange, and obscure crimes of yesteryear. I'm your host, Lindsay Valenti, and with me is my sister and co-host, Maddie Stangle. Hello! Hi! So before we get started, I wanted to shout out our friends, Sean and Chris, over at Shots and Thoughts. Thank you for letting me publish our collab episode with you where we discussed the golden age of piracy because I did not get my shit together in time to record an actual episode for the week that I was on vacation. So. And that's thanks. okay. Cause you were on vacation. Yeah. And it was a good episode. It was a good episode. That's why I thought it was a good one to share. So I'm hoping everyone who listened enjoyed it. And that you will go check out Sean and Chris and Ryan on Shots and Thoughts. They're good people. And on that note, we're going to be talking about some not good people today. Oh, no. (laughs) It's going to be a mix of bad people and good people. So it's a mix of the two. Because I decided this week... That we are going to be discussing poaching and the preservation of Yellowstone. Ah, so it did tie in with your vacation. It did. It was inspired by my vacation. Did you get inspired at Yellowstone? I did. It's very pretty there. The geysers smell awful. I almost I almost threw up. At one point, when we were at one of the geyser spots, because it was a it was a near thing, I was like, "Oh God, it's gonna happen! I'm gonna be that person that throws up." At you. So... <laughs> <laughs> but thankfully, it didn't happen. Good. I will say that some of the geysers have very hilarious names. Like there is one that is called Black Pearl, and I took a picture is of it. it- Because of black sulfur? No, I think it's because of like how the inside of it looks. Hmm. Because it's all black on the inside. Okay. I shared it on social, but there's a lake that spans the continental divide and it's called Issa Lake. Mm -hmm. Issa Lake. And I was like, what's that? Issa Lake. It's it's way easier to do in a Midwestern accent. Oh, it's a lake. It is. It's a lake. <laughs> Duh. Amazing. What else did you think it was? It's a lake. It's a lake. <laughs> Perfect. Oh, okay. On that note, uh, information was pulled from the following sources. 2022 Yellowstone National Park Trips article, 2021 Inside Hook article by Tobias Carroll, 2021 Smithsonian article by Alan Katz, 2016 NRDC article by Jason Bittle, 2015 Smithsonian article by Jim Morrison, 
2011 Yellowstone Gate article by Jim Davis, the Climb blog post, National Park Foundation website, National Park Service website, Yellowstone Junior Ranger booklet, yeah, I went there, and <laughs> Yellowstone Reports article by Rick Lamplum. Lampla. Lampla. And links to all of these articles will be included in the show notes. And yes, I did get my Junior Park Ranger badge at Yellowstone and the Badlands and Devil's Tower. Nice. I just love the fact that there are a bunch of gyms that you got your information from. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I had a couple questions, just went to Jim. He knew. (laughs) (laughs) Jim and Rick. (laughs) Jim didn't know, so I had to go to Rick. (laughs) You know, Ranger Rick. It was actually a bunch of raccoons that wrote these articles. (laughs) Junior Ranger Jim. Ranger Rick. Just a bunch of (laughs) chocolate. Chocolate smears from like the trash they were into. All the s'more the s'more remnants. It's just marshmallows and <sighs> chocolate smear. Gross. On this day in 1872 <laughs> <laughs> Chocolate. <laughs> so as I have alluded to my family and I took a road trip to Yellowstone this year to celebrate their 150th anniversary. Nice. And it was during this trip, and as I was working alongside my youngest to get our junior park ranger badges, as I also mentioned, that I learned about how one of the park's biggest draws was almost wiped out entirely. Rut row. Rut row, indeed. Yellowstone is the first official national park in the United States and was established as such on March 1st, 1872 by President Ulysses S. Grant when he signed the Yellowstone National Park Protection Act into law. This act ensured that the Department of the Interior was in charge of the, quote, preservation from injury or spoliation of all timber, mineral deposits, natural curiosities, or wonders within said park and their retention in their natural condition, end quote. Stop moving west. (laughs) Leave this section of the west alone. Stop moving (laughs) east. Don't touch this one. Don't touch here. It's too spicy. (laughs) Some some parts of it are too spicy. (laughs) Said geysers. Today, our national parks have become an over $646 billion industry, that caters to a variety of people, campers, fishermen, climbers, hikers, backpackers, and your average tourist. And murderers. <laughs> and murderers. Let's not forget murderers. Yep. For those who don't know, Yellowstone is located in the western part of the United States, hence our jokes about going west. Mm-hmm. Specifically, the northwest corner of Wyoming, as well as parts of Montana and Idaho, Yellowstone spans almost 3,500 miles, or 5,633 kilometers, and is one of the largest national parks in the United States. Nice. And it's got a a little strip where it's It does have a little strip. The Wild West. Mm Mm-hmm. Home of natural geysers, such as Old Faithful. It also is the home of the oldest and largest herd of bison in the United States. Aw, they were protected. Mm Mm-hmm. A herd that was almost made extinct thanks to the efforts of men like Edgar Howell. Yeah, fuck that guy. Oh, wait, no. Yeah, fuck that guy. He's good. No, fuck that guy. Okay, fuck that guy. (laughs) Your first instinct was the right instinct. (laughs) Even though Yellowstone had been granted national park status during its inception, none of what went into the act was enforced. Of course not. Because, of course, <laughs> there were no gyms or ricks to protect it. At the time. No. Captain Moses Harris, along with his troops from Company M, 1st Cavalry, marched into Yellowstone in August 1886. At the time, there was little to no federal funding to protect the park. So mm. the cavalry were in charge of it. That's kind of funny. It is. Before the cavalry arrived... 
The poaching within the park was so bad that Buffalo Bill Cody wrote a letter to the New York Sun begging for protections for the park. Buff- yeah, Buffalo Bill Cody. Was like, guys, we need help. <laughs> he was. That's insane. He was like, y'all, I can only do my Wild West show so much. <laughs> and I can't give y'all all my money. But we got to help these parks, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> and so they, they brought the army. <laughs> they were like, you got it, Cody. We're going to give you a couple bang, 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 shoot shooters to, <laughs> to keep the trees safe. <laughs> Some bang bang shooter ups. In addition to the poaching, there was a number of timber cutting as well as forest fires set by angry settlers that devastated a number of acres. I wanted my house to be here. I'm going to burn it down. <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah. That's so rude. Ye old Karens. Pretty much. Mm-hmm. Precious travertine was also taken by settlers to be sold as souvenirs. So that's like a precious mineral. Yeah, it sounds nice. It does sound nice. Travertine. Don't leave home without your travertine. Sounds like something you put in milk. You'll die. (laughs) Sweet chocolatey travertine. (laughs) That's where the spiciness comes from. We don't understand how she died. Maybe it's the giant rock in her glass of milk. (laughs) Maybe it's the fact that her milk is gray. (laughs) Mima and her gray milk. Why, Mima? Why? (laughs) I just wanted to taste the old weast one more time. (laughs) Oh, shit. Chocolate Trevor T. <laughs> Rich chocolatey Trevor T. Oh, it's, it's brown. <laughs> oh, no. That's awesome. I got it right. <laughs> it could be brown milk. Oh, no. Ah, oh, yes. Okay. <laughs> it's fibrous. Nice. <laughs> Okay, sorry, go ahead. Okay. Poaching was so common and so bad that it accounted for the deaths of around 4,000 elk in the Mammoth Hot Springs Basin alone in one year. Dang. Some poachers even took out as many as 25 to 50 elk a day during the winter when the snow was deep enough to slow their escape. That's awful. Additionally, bison were nearing the brink of extinction after being slaughtered for their hides, for sport, and to get back at the indigenous peoples who depended on the bison for clothing, food, and shelter. Of course. Here. Sorry we killed your bison. Here have this blanket that definitely doesn't have smallpox on it. Yep. People suck. Yeah. In 1887, William James was caught beaver poaching in Yellowstone and quickly found himself kicked out of the park. Even though he saw no jail time, he found that his reputation as a poacher prevented him from getting gainful employment. Surprise, surprise. (laughs) So he did the only logical thing and sent a letter to the captain of the local army contingent before setting the woods on fire. Dear army. I'm going to set the, the, the woods on fire. If you see this, it's already on fire. <laughs> Sincerely, a friend. Your friendly neighborhood just, beaver poacher. I'm just going to put my name on it, because why not? Yeah. But William wasn't satisfied with just setting the forest on fire. He decided that robbing a stagecoach was his next best bet. And what better than to hold up the stagecoach that travel between Fort Yellowstone and Garnier, Montana, letting him get back at the very cavalrymen that had ruined his life. Okay. As you probably guessed, uh, William wasn't the sharpest tack. And on the night of July 4th, 1887, instead of hitting up the paymaster's stagecoach, he ended up robbing a passenger stagecoach. However... The person he ended up robbing was none other than esteemed lawyer John F. Lacey of Oskaloosa, Iowa, who Uh formerly served 
in the Union Army during the Civil War. You don't mess with Iowans. No. And he didn't appreciate having a gun in his face, especially when the man on the other end of the barrel was a no-good beaver poacher who only got away with $16, or around $492 today, and two rare coins. Even though it wasn't the biggest score that he had planned for, uh, William couldn't prevent himself from bragging about the robbery. Of course not. again, not... Not the sharpest tack. He got coins. Well, look at my coins. Look at my strange and exotic coins. So it wasn't long before he found himself in police custody a few months later, after two men came forward detailing the strange coins that had been in his possession. Yep. Coins that exactly matched those that had been stolen from John Lacey. By 1888, poachers were still active in the park, so it's been a national park for about 18 years now, or 16 years okay. now. Okay. Not to mention, railroad companies were doing their best to come up with ways to build passages through the park for their locomotives. Such a great scenery. Wow. Mm -hmm. Choo-choo. And cutting time down. Yeah. Additionally, the army had set up a fort in the park to wage war on the indigenous peoples, who called Yellowstone home in an effort to drive them out of the land that was rightfully theirs, a.k.a. Fort Yellowstone. That sounds about right. Congress was so fed up with the poor management of the park that they refused to allocate funds. That'll do it. Yeah. As a compromise, the military was put in charge of the park under the direction of the Department of the Interior, as I mentioned. Mm-hmm. The first troops consisted of around 60 men, and they allocated a lot of time and manpower to protecting the geysers of the park, which were heavily vandalized. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> just says, just says, your ma. <laughs> <laughs> That's all it says. There's... There's these signs, these beautiful signs there right now that have a picture of like a little boy standing on top of a geyser and he's like screaming. And then there's like his mom like reaching for him and also screaming. And then two other children that are screaming. And then like all these other people in the background that are not doing anything. Oh, and it's funny. like, oh, Jeffy, <laughs> Jeffy, we told you not to step on the geyser. <laughs> My legs That's are melting, Ma. <laughs> <laughs> Jimothy! No! <laughs> Captain Harris ensured that his men put a halt to all hunting of both prey and predators, trapping and fishing that was done without a hook and line. So you couldn't, like, set up big traps for fish. Got or it. big, you know, like nets and stuff. Mm -hmm. He also called for the halt of alcohol sales, except to authorized hotels. They also enforced rules that prevented tourists from throwing rocks, sticks, and any other debris into the geysers. Because that's bad. Don't do that. Yeah. At the time, the U.S. Cavalry was in charge of patrolling and protecting the park from poachers. But ironically, they only had one patrolman assigned to do the job. One man. Hey, guys. To go through no. and protect... <laughs> 3,500 miles of terrain. Of yeah. course poachers were going to be able to run wild. Right, and I bet they gave it to a rookie, too. Welcome to the unit. Jimothy. This is your job now. <laughs> <laughs> Give it to Jimothy. He doesn't know anything. His legs are all melted. <laughs> I told you to stay out of the gases, Jimothy. I can't help it. The water looks so pretty. I ain't got no legs. <laughs> Lieutenant Dan. Strap on these skis, son, and go explore the wilds. Catch yourself a poacher. <laughs> Jimothy later invented the jacuzzi. It's like a geyser, only it won't kill you. <laughs> it's like an, a less spicy geyser. <laughs> it's not nearly as spicy. It's called your ma. <laughs> Ha 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 ha! 
won't melt your legs off. <laughs> In fact, the military was only able to capture about 2% of the poachers every year. Yeah, because it's just Timothy with his no legs on his sled. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Poachers of the 1890s were tough and able to survive in the park virtually undetected. They built camouflaged huts and dugouts where they cleaned the game they caught. Their vast survival experience gave them an advantage over the military, who were often transferred out of the park before they could become knowledgeable woodsmen. Which makes sense. That's stupid, though. Not only that, but even if they did find a poacher, they'd only be able to pursue and arrest them if they actually caught them in the act. Otherwise, they were free to go. One way that Captain Harris worked around this was to confiscate their possessions and lock them away in the guardhouse for weeks before they expelled the poachers from the park. Mm -hmm. So he'd be like, I'm going to take your guns. I'm going to take your shit. Get out of here. Now get (laughs) Don't you come back now, you know? <laughs> Poachers were most active in the winter, so the soldiers eventually <laughs> created ski patrols and worked with the indigenous peoples to learn how to survive in the harsh weather of the mountains and Yellowstone. We're not gonna we're not gonna give you the blankets yet. If you tell, <laughs> tell us how to ski. <laughs> and then once we build a chalet in Yellowstone. <laughs> Like, we don't want you here, but at the same time, like, tell us how to live here. Because we got these skis and we need to go take care of these people who are all shoot, shoot, gun, gun. Yep. By working with the locals that lived around the park, the soldiers were also able to learn the names of the poachers that they were tracking. In one respect, the military was craftier than the poachers, given their combat experience. Scout Jim McBride wrote of one encounter in his journal, quote, yeah. I know it's in the gym. Two of us found a fellow near Snake River, whom we'd expected of possessing furs. I started up to him and he shot at me. I dropped on the ground and lay behind a rock while he fired seven times. When he had emptied his rifle, I knocked him off his horse with the butt of my gun, end quote. Nice. Fuck you. This is the police. How dare you shoot at me? (laughs) Say fuck you. (laughs) Edgar Howell, who I mentioned earlier, a Cook City resident, was notorious for eluding the soldiers and had been surviving the winter in Yellowstone since February of 1894 by hunting buffalo and traveling using cross-country skis. Howell lived in a teepee hidden deep in the woods along a stringent creek in Pelican Valley, that was also guarded by his dog. Known for his sharp eye and his prowess with the repeater gun, he quickly became the most sought-after poacher in the entire United States. Thankfully, luck was on the cavalry side on March 13, 1894, when Sergeant Troik and civilian scout Felix Burgess happened to be near Howell when he was removing the head of a bison on Pelican Creek during a windstorm. The inclement weather gave the soldiers the chance to apprehend him before using a telephone, which at the time was very new, to call the rest of the cavalry for help. It took six army men to bring him in. Dang, was he a big guy? I don't know. I saw a picture of him. He didn't look that big, but he must have been scrappy. Hmm. I mean, if you can drag a bison, you're probably pretty strong. If you can, yeah, cut his head off and stuff. Yeah. It said that Howell was so pissed off at his capture that he attempted to kill his own dog after it failed to alert him to the soldier's presence. Ew. Yeah. Somebody give him a smallpox blanket. (laughs) Yeah, no kidding. I should also note that while on their way to find Howell, Troik and Burgess also found six bison heads hanging from a tree that had also been killed by Howell. It's awful. Mm Mm-hmm. Captain Anderson wrote the following about Edgar's capture in a letter to the Secretary of the Interior, and this is a little long. Quote, Sometimes since one of my snowshoe ski parties got on the trail of a man with a sled on a stringent creek near Pelican, the trail was old when discovered, and in consequence it was not followed. About the same time, a man ascertained to be one Ed Howell of Cook City passed my station of Soda Butte in the night. 
and went on into Cook. I knew that he was not carrying out any trophies, so I determined to make further search on the Pelican. On the sixth instance, I started out a party consisting of Captain Scott, Lieutenant Forsyth, Burgess the Scout, two sergeants, and Haynes, F.J., the park photographer. On the twelfth instance, in a terrific storm, Burgess and the sergeants started across to the Pelican country and camped. Next a.m., he found near his camp a cache of six buffalo scalps and skulls, three good skins, and three more that the hair had been partially taken off. The trail was there, but dim, of the poacher, and it was soon lost. However, Burgess kept on, and about noon of that day he ran into a fresh trail, which he followed to a lodge, erected near the mouth of a stringent creek. While there, he heard several shots, and soon saw the culprit down in the middle of the Pelican Valley. Here he performed an act of bravery that deserves a special mention and recognition. The poacher was undoubtedly armed with a repeating rifle. It was equally certain that he was a desperate character and would resist arrest even to the point of taking life. The only arms Burgess and the sergeant carried was a single army revolver. Notwithstanding the serious risk, they boldly started forward over the 400 yards of open valley. The poacher was so occupied in skinning his buffalo that he did not see Burgess until he was within 15 or 20 feet of him. He then started to for his rifle, but on order from Burgess, stopped and surrendered. Near him were the bodies of five buffalo freshly killed. End quote. At this time in history, bison scalps fetched $300 a piece, or around $10,200 today. Which is why he wouldn't stop. Yep. If Howell had been allowed to continue poaching, it's likely that the population, which in 1902 only numbered 23, would have been wiped out. Jeez. As Howell was being transported back to the guardhouse in Mammoth, News correspondent Emerson Howe ran into the party. Howell bragged to Emerson that his punishment would be light, just expulsion from the park, and he'd lose less than $30, or around $1,000 today, worth of gear. His bedding, teepee, and toboggan were all destroyed, and the scalps of the bison he'd slaughtered were preserved, because they weren't just going to throw them away. Right. The whole story was published in The Forest and Stream magazine. Included in the article was the now famous photo of four cavalrymen posing next to seven bison that had been illegally poached and killed. In a strange twist, the photo that was ultimately published wasn't, in fact, a photo of the bison that Howell had actually killed. The photo that was sent to Forest and Stream came from an edition of the annual report of the Smithsonian Institute that had been published seven years earlier in 1887. The photo was sent by William T. Hornaday, who ran the collection of living animals at the Smithsonian's National Zoological Park. As you can imagine, even with the snafu, the photo and article caused public outrage. I bet. Thanks to editor George Bird Grinnell, the story helped create legislation from Representative John F. Lacey. Does that name sound familiar? It sure does. On March 26th, just 13 days after Howell's arrest, Lacey introduced a bill to protect Yellowstone's wildlife, prohibit hunting, and punish poachers. Congress passed the Lacey Act of 1894 on April 6th, making it unlawful to, quote, import, export, sell, acquire, or purchase fish, birds, and other wildlife from any state, tribal territory, or foreign nation, where doing so is prohibited, end quote. Nice. The law probably sounds redundant, but it had to be worded that way to ensure that poachers would be unable to just take what they'd caught and sell it somewhere else. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they had to make sure there were no loopholes. Yep. Additionally, the Lacey Act re- regulates the import and transportation of numerous species that cause problems when outside their natural habitats, such as boa constrictors, for example. It also protects native species from the spread of invasive and foreign contagions, like all those frogs that got sick from a bunch of bacteria that one time. Yep. 
It was even amended in 2008 to include plants and is a law that's still in effect today. And you'll never guess who the first person to be convicted under this new law was. Did he kill a bunch of bison? Edgar Howell. Ding, ding, ding. Mm -hmm. Howell was arrested the next summer in July when he was spotted in a barber's chair in Mammoth in Yellowstone. He was convicted on August 8th, 1894, under the Lacey Act, and sentenced to a month in jail, as well as fined $50, or around $1,700 today. Even though he was arrested, he was actually proud of his role in changing the laws that protected the park. Of course he was. In fact, in a very strange twist, he went on to become a detective in the park in 1896, helping to capture a number of stagecoach bandits and poachers. So he just turned his life around two years later. Yeah, they basically were like, to catch a thief, we need to think like a thief. You know what I mean? That old adage. Mm -hmm. So that's why they gave him the job. Apparently he was good at it. So good, I guess. I'm sure he was. The Yellowstone Park Act, which was established on May 7th, 1894, placed the park under the exclusive jurisdiction of the United States. According to the law, all hunting, killing, wounding, or capturing of any bird or wild animal, quote, except dangerous animals when it is necessary to prevent them from destroying human life or inflicting an injury, end quote, was prohibited. The real heart of the act is as follows, quote, Any person found guilty of violating any of the provisions of this act or any rule or or regulation that may be promulgated by the Secretary of the Interior with reference to the management and care of the park or for the protection of the property therein, for the preservation from injury or spoliation of timber, mineral deposits, natural curiosities, or wonderful objects within said park, shall be deemed guilty of a misdemeanor and shall be subjected to a fine of not more than $1,000 or imprisonment not exceeding two years or both, and be adjudged to pay all costs of the proceedings, end quote. Nice. So not worth it, in other words. No, definitely not. Captain F.A. Boutel took over for Captain Harris as the commander of the cavalry regulating the park. Captain Boutel had no qualms pushing back when Congress wanted to construct an elevator that would allow tourists to travel to the bottom of Yellowstone's Grand Canyon. No. Captain Boutel fought back against any form of commercialization in the park and won. Nice. It was written in one of the papers that the Army's wildlife protection was leading to overpopulation. And this is a fun little ditty that someone wrote. Quote, (laughs) <laughs> Ananias Anderson is captain of the guard. He patrols the National Reserve. He guards the U.S. Yard. And neath his magnifying eyes and multiplying tongue, the increased herds of game are more than when the world was young. End quote. As it should be, motherfucker. Yeah, like that's the point. That's the whole thing. Did you miss the part where the bison were almost extinct? Like, duh. Yep. Okay. During his time as vice president and president of the United States, Theodore Roosevelt campaigned tirelessly for the conservation of public lands, later establishing the national park system that protects 85 million acres of land across America. The military administration that was instituted at Yellowstone became the basis for management of further parks, such as Yosemite, Sequoia, and Kings Canyon National Parks in California. It wasn't until 1916 that the National Park Service was created, allowing the military to withdraw from Yellowstone officially in 1918. And today, 4,900 bison call Yellowstone home, which is a far cry from the 23 that were in Yellowstone in 1916. And thanks to a derpy stagecoach robber and the efforts of John F. Lacey, we can now enjoy them and the rest of the natural beauties of Yellowstone. Nice. And that is the story of poaching and preservation of Yellowstone and other natural parks. That's a good one. 
I was like, I don't want to talk about murder this week. I'm going to talk about something kind of warm and fuzzy. Mm -hmm. Like bison. Bison. They're so pretty. They're so dumb, but they're so pretty. (laughs) They're like big, dumb cats. They're so funny. (laughs) The definition of weird is suggesting something is supernatural or uncanny. While the definition of distraction is a thing that prevents someone from giving full attention to something else. Mix both of those words together, add a millennial with a mic, and you have Weird Distractions Podcast. Weird Distractions is a weekly true crime, paranormal, conspiracy theory podcast hosted by me, Alex. Each week, I tell you what I need a distraction from before diving into a topic to help me distract myself from, well, whatever is going on. My hope is that you too can get a distraction from tuning in and maybe learn something on the way. From haunted hospitals to cold cases and every bizarre online theory in between, there's a little something for every weirdo out there. If this sounds up your alley, then join me every Sunday on your favorite podcast platform or search Weird Distractions Podcast on any social media account. Need a distraction? I got you. This week's podcast plug is Weird Distractions a weekly show hosted by our good friend Alex, who's also a member of the Cultivate Network, where she discusses true crime, conspiracy theories, paranormal stories, and more to provide a weird distraction from everyday life. New episodes come out every Sunday at 7 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, and we will have a link to her show in the show notes. Nice. And we still got no listener questions. Okay. So what's something good you'd like to share? Good starts out kind of sad. So Willie, for the first time since I've had him for like five and a half years, got really, really sick. He was having a lot of stomach issues. And Friday, he was just totally not himself, hiding, couldn't keep water down, like just in bad shape. Mm Mm-hmm. And so I took him to his vet, who I really love, and it was heartwarming for me because my vet tech that I see there and my vet immediately were like, this is not Willie. This is not the Willie we know. Mm -hmm. Something is very wrong. So Mm -hmm. like they know him well enough to know that something is off. Mm -hmm. And thankfully, like... His blood panel came back clean. There were no like glaring obstructions in his abdomen. So he got rehydrated and was given some medication. And they're closed on the weekend. So they were like, email us and we'll be checking the emails this weekend. So in my helicopter panic, <laughs> <laughs> I emailed them a lot on Saturday because he was not improving as much as I wanted him to. And he still wouldn't eat and didn't want to go potty. He just wanted to sit outside and like smell the air. So we Mm -hmm. did a lot of like sitting outside, which ruined me Sunday. My allergies were like awful. But we had gotten him to eat Saturday night. And then Sunday, we took his brother to daycare. We took his brother to daycare both days so that he could rest. Mm -hmm. And then when we came back from daycare, the daycare drop-off, Willie greeted us with his, like, typical Willie greet with a puppy Mm -hmm. car wash, which is, like, him wagging his tail and weaving his body between your legs. Mm -hmm. And then he was acting like he was starving. So, like, I was slowly giving him some food throughout the day. And we got to share, like, our favorite snack, which are peanut peanut butter puffs and... He is pretty much healed. He hasn't gone number two yet, so that's going to be a nightmare whenever that happens. Oh, God. Yeah. It's going to be so bad. (laughs) But I am just really, really, really thankful of his vet and his team. And I'm very thankful that he was healthy because everybody's immediate first thought based on his age was cancer. And Mm -hmm. it was not. That's good. Yeah. So that is my really good thing, is my Willie is back and he's recuperating. Nice. What's your good thing? So the trip was fun. Like, I could 
wax poetic about everything we did. But one thing that stood out to me that I can directly relate back to the podcast is we stopped at this 1880s town outside of Murdo, South Dakota. Okay. And you remember, I can't remember what county fair it was, but how they used to have like that Wild West area and they would have like the guys that would have, would do the fake shootouts with like the rubber bullets and things like that. You might've been too young for that. Yeah. You might not remember that. But it was Sounds a town familiar. like that. It was like a reconstruction of an old West town where they had like moved different buildings from different spots in the surrounding area into like this one recreated town. Yeah. And in the main building, they had this little exhibit and they had a camel statue up there, like a like a model yeah! camel. And I'm like, <gasps> I'm like, I'm like, why is there this camel here? And then I looked over at this like framed picture write up thing next to it. And I was like, that is the monument of High Jolly Mm -hmm. from the Camel Corps. And I lost my mind. And I was like, (laughs) I know that. And I freaked out (laughs) and was like trying to explain it to the girls. And they were just like, whatever, we're tired. And (laughs) so we're, we're wandering around the town and they have this little pasture area where they had a couple donkeys and I glanced over and they had a camel they had a camel and his name is Otis and he likes popcorn and that's amazing (laughs) they had had a write-up again like that said like why a camel and it talked about the camel core and I was so excited it made me so happy that like (laughs) that part of history wasn't just like completely forgotten obscure it into the ether yeah like the this random obscure 1880s town has like stuff about it like that just made me so happy so so yeah even though high jolly is like a super racist name for a camel they didn't based off (laughs) they didn't know otis is a much more appropriate name for a camel it is it's a much more appropriate name for a camel in south dakota otis yeah So I thought that was super cool. It was like one of the highlights of the trip, like being like, oh, my God, the camel core. Amazing. (laughs) So, yeah, I thought that was really cool. All right, let's shut her down. So you can find us online at yieldcrimepodcast.com. We're also on Twitter at yieldcrimepod and on Instagram and Facebook at yieldcrimepodcast. We're also on YouTube. You can also send us something in the mail Mm -hmm. to our P.O. Box, which is Yield Crime Podcast, P.O. Box 341, Wyoming, Minnesota 55092. You can also email us at yieldcrimepodcast at gmail.com. Send questions. That that would be great. (laughs) Please. Yes. Questions. Or gifts. Our friend Elizabeth sends us gifts, and I like that. It's nice. That is pretty great. He's nice. If you'd like to support the show but can't do so financially, a great way to do so is to leave us a five-star rating and review on Apple Podcasts, Podchaser, Good Pods, or a five-star rating on Spotify. I do not know the name of who left this review on Apple Podcasts because it is a screenshot of their review, so I apologize to whoever left this, but it says it's a five-star review that says, ye old great show. Wow, what a great show. Lindsay and Madison bring a lot of terrific energy into each episode in a delightful way. The topics they discuss might be a little unusual, but I wouldn't have it any other way. Smiley face. Aww. So thank you, random Apple Podcasts reviewer person. Yes, thank you. If you'd like to support us financially, you can do so on Buy Me a Coffee to leave a one-time donation. If you'd like to support us on a monthly basis, you can do so over on our Patreon for as low as a dollar a month to get early ad-free access to all of our content. You can also purchase some of our merch over at our Tee Public shop through the end of today, Wednesday, July 13th. Is that right? July 13th? Yeah. You get free shipping anywhere. Nice. Doesn't matter. Free shipping. So take advantage. Because shipping can be really expensive. That doesn't happen often. 
No, I was surprised when I got the email and I was like, I need to mention this because <laughs> it's it's international. It's everywhere. Right. Free shipping. So take advantage. Awesome. And on that note, as always, I'm Lindsay. And I'm Madison. And we'll see you next time with another tale. As old as crime. <laughs>